I've been trying to sort of push, I'm starting to move towards at this point, uh, what humans are involved to do, evolved to do. And what, what, what is it what we're good at? And the thing about it is, is when a creature is good at something, that's genetic. Okay, it's part of our architecture. And that can be physically what we're adapted to do, and also mentally. And mentally means all sorts of things. I mean, the sorts of ways in which we organize ourselves socially, the types of way in which we apply ourselves into the environment. And with humans, that also means things such as creativity and all sorts of other things that are part of this repertoire that makes us healthy because our genes express themselves normally when your body's doing what it's supposed to do. Right? And that includes exercise, eating the right foods, and all these things. So really, the part of this course is to figure out what is it that we're designed to eat and do and how we're supposed to actually be living and how we have been doing that for 99% of all our evolutionary history. And then comparing that to what we're doing now, you know, living in modern society. Is there a complement or is there a mismatch? And what are the results of that mismatch, right? Which we're seeing all around us, right? Mental health behavioral issues, physical health behavioral issues. Right? Now, looking at that evolutionary history and comparing it, of course, to what we are in the state right now, and then reflecting on that state, cultural state, and figuring out what we can do about it. What are the major things in which we can change in our environment? And things you can do within your own life to where there's a complement, because you're not going to evolve in one generation to match the conditions that we're living in now. And we're talking about thousands, hundreds of thousands of generations of humans. And of course the detriment will happen to other people and your, your children's downline will be incredible. So that's the applied end of the course. And I told you guys at the very beginning of the class that I think all the stuff that we're doing you know, in the sciences right now should not just be sitting in the book racks, pure you know, research, just not applied to humans. It should be applied to humans in a way that's tangible because there's too many people starving. The economic situations are too grave right now for us not to. So this is your chance to actually do you know, applied anthropology, taking the knowledge that we've learned and turn it into something actually productive. And I can actually do that with many of my students have actually gone into all sorts of areas of city planning, you know, public health and doing all sorts of stuff that they never thought they would have done before. But really, if it wasn't for this question that they actually have to answer because the answers which they produce they look at them they go damn i can do that i mean i can do that and they actually change their careers so um i started this course as an experiment these sort of questions and maybe 10 years ago and sort of waited to see you know with the hopeful that it would actually pay off and it certainly has so that's my that's where we're really heading now i started this module um, with the first sort of species of genus homo homo erectus because this is really where we begin to start seeing, you know, the evolution of human, what we're evolved to do, right? There is some stuff that we see in the apes and through the Australopithecines. And the thing about it is, is that's exactly what this book is about, the reader in which you're starting right now, the story of the human body. Now, to prove for you, this is exactly what Dan Lieberman is doing. Um, first of all, is that he and I are part of the Society of Evolutionary Medicine. I and Steve Johnson, which are another professor here. And we meet all these guys, this guy's from Harvard. We're talking about big universities of all over the world that are moving into this direction, talking about evolutionary health and disease, right? It says evolution, health and disease in the subtitle. So in the beginning of the book, what he discusses are, is that what primates are really evolved to do? And then in the first introduction, he talks about this missing monkey, this missing monkey who, who goes disappearing, escapes from a zoo in Florida. And everyone is worried that this monkey is not going to make it, you know? A year later, they find the monkey, the monkey's doing just fine, you know, because primates are good generals. We can scavenge, we can do just about anything. But here's the thing, if that monkey was left out there for a long enough period of time, he would be experiencing degenerating health. We're good at going for fallback foods all the time. Dude, we can even eat Pop-Tarts and live, right? But how long can we rely on fallback foods before they begin to affect our health? Right. A good generalist is great at getting all sorts of scraps, but it doesn't mean it's for the long term. Right. So his story begins with that. And he's trying to make an analogy that that's really us. That we're living on fallback foods and all sorts of stuff that we're processing that get us by. But there's going to be long term deleterious consequences. So we need to figure out really how to figure out what is the real heart. You know, we do have a pretty good breadth of our diet, but what is the acceptable breadth? What foods are we really evolved to actually eat? And if we can target on that and realize that we're subsisting on cheap fallback foods, we can create laws, perhaps, right, or rules 
about restricting some of those uh, those bad foods from our diet. So he begins right from chapter one to do it. Now he if he looks at the the trajectory from all sort of thick things essentially that are pre-planning our body to become, you know, very fallback foodish, you know, because we're evolved for starvation diets. And we can see that as far back as apes. And module three, I mentioned, particularly in primate evolution slides, and I hope you won't pay attention to that, especially with the evolution of apes, it's so critically important, that apes at the end of the Miocene, roughly just about nine to 10 million years ago, we're going through several crises in Europe as well <clears throat> as in Africa. One was the Venetian crisis, and we didn't have a mezzanine crisis, all these crises in which you know, food was disappearing. The climate was coming very seasonal. And apes had to adapt very quickly and become big generalists. And of course, we're the clay of those apes that broke off and were able to get on the ground and forage, not only for foods that are on the ground, but back up in the trees. So we started this trend. But assisting us heavily were changes in our biochemistry. And one of them was, we can see it in the elevated serum levels of you know, um, uric acid in our bodies. And that uric acid body can be detrimental to ourselves because it can cause all sorts of diseases such as gout and other, other issues, right? But the trade-off is, is that high serum levels of uric acid are in the cellular areas of your body, prevent fructose from being broken down into glucose and utilizes energy. It sends that fructose into a fat shunt so you can store a lot of fat very quickly. And particularly fructose because it comes to the end of the season fruits. When there's not gonna be any fruit anymore, I mean, that's when it's really rich in fructose and your body's storing and putting on a ton of fat. And it tells us at that point that we're really adapted for starvation conditions. That the idea of getting your three squares or four squares a meal and then snacks at night 365 by 24, you know, 12 months out of the year is not what we're supposed to be doing. And our genetic architecture will suffer from it. In fact, our, our, our pancreas can't handle it, which is why we get diabetes, is putting out so much insulin to try to control all these blood sugar movements up and down, when normally it gets rest periods. And those rest periods are when there simply isn't any food around. And we utilize our fat stores. You know, humans are designed to put on a little weight and then bring them way down to the winter time, all the way almost down to nothing again. And sort of a cycle, a little bit of a cycle. We're not designed to stay plump like this forever. We have tremendous health consequences because of it. In addition, when we look at Australopathy kings, they're one of the first that really begin to get a tremendous amount of exercise or active all the time. And that is really a state in which humans need to be in. And the sort of societies in which we've created have created a great deal of inactivity. And you can see that by becoming uh, you know, a student as well as uh, uh, getting to be a, quite a portly professor here. So I need to actually pay attention to my own roles here. But I'm also trapped by society. It forces me to do this. It forces me to behave in this way and live in this way. So we've literally trapped ourselves into an unhealthy situation. And we need arguments to untrap ourselves. That's the way government is. No one does anything unless you give them a logical argument. So we can start all the way back with the apes and move to the Australopithecus, which is exactly what Lieberman does. So he's building an argument, you know, how the Australopithecus are changing our body's requirements. Then he moves into the first members of our genus, Homo, the Homo erectus. And that produces a different sort of change. And that's what we're really gonna talk about to do today. But why this book is really good for this, and you can do this entire, you know, essay question on this book, if you look towards the end of it, and a lot of people don't go through the books, I always, every time I take a look at it, I want to see exactly what's in this book, okay? All right, well, look at the, uh, uh, um, right by the time we even get to the Australopithecus, there's a, there's a first chapter here, and it's called Paradise Lost. Uh-oh, we had something, a hunting gathering sort of way of life, and we created agriculture. What did agriculture do to us? Why was that the worst invention? And how can we do better than agriculture? And then it talks about modern times, modern bodies. You know, what are the problems specifically with the modern times we're living and how has it affected ourselves and the genetic architecture? So you can draw everything right from here. Right? And he goes into the next chapter, the vicious cycle of too much, right? So you're getting everything that you need to talk about what sort of myth, a cultural mismatch, disuse, the chapter called disuse, right? So, um, uh oh, the hidden dangers of novelty and comfort, right? So he's telling us, he's giving you every, the whole laundry list about what is wrong with our culture, okay? And that needs to go in your essay. 
half your essay. See, you spelling out the problems isn't good enough. What I expect you to do is tell me what the solutions are. Okay? And I'm not going to tell you what those solutions are, and neither is this guy, Dan Lieberman. Because here's what we totally believe, and I'm going to be quite frank with you guys. That not only my generation, but the generations before us have fucked the world up for you guys. So why are we going to give you guys solutions on the way out of it? Would you trust us? I wouldn't trust us. It's time to reinvent this world and push the boomers away. You're done, boomers. Guys like me got to go. So I'm only going to point out the rocks where the problems are. You guys point the solutions. You build the world the way that you want it, the way that it actually should be for you. And stop paying attention to us because we're failures. Okay. And I'm going to be wholehearted with you guys. So, this is your little manifesto about how you're going to live that life, how you're going to come together and actually do this. And if it actually takes tearing the political machinery apart, so be it. Humans have had to do it before. We can do it again. It's just the challenges that we face when we arise. All right. So, that part, hopefully, you'll take to heart and you'll think about the things and what you can do in your life, things we should be doing, the laws we should be having based on the knowledge that you've got. So, you don't have to look outside this book. However, I have placed little papers in there for you in certain sections. So when we're, I'm doing a share here on Homo erectus, the first species, um, I put little things such as, you know, reference readings in here. There's a reference reading. So the Evolved to Exercise by Herman Pulzer. That little paper is a powerful little paper. We are evolved to exercise. So, you know, when, if you want to spotlight the issues that we have because of inactivity, that is the one which you can draw from, as well as as Daniel Lieberman's have a nice little section on, you know, bringing back basic educational and fitness programs to high school. And we had it in the 1960s. John Kennedy came into presidential office and he mandated this. He mandated this. a federal mandate. This was no joke. It, it, back then it worked. And the, the schools could not resist because Kennedy said, you're going to have a fitness program and you're going to recognize benchmarks of fitness and you're going to require it in their students. That's just it. Because we can't afford as a people, the health problems, right, that will come of this. Mental health, all sorts of issues are linked to physical health. I even had a little presidential fitness patch if I could do sorts of things, and I was so proud of it when I was a kid to actually get that, right? Well, I mean, that may have worked in the 1960s. It doesn't mean it's going to work now, but you have to have ways in which to sort of engender sort of fitness and the importance of it, right? So the thing about it is, is I think now is the time for not mandating things, but showing people the argument why. Why should I get off my ass, right? One of my students says, you know, I don't need to exercise because when I do a lot of drinking, my body seems just fine to me, you know? And I started to laugh and I go, yeah, but you're not gonna live very long, right? And then he said, well, that's my prerogative. I don't wanna live long or not. And what I said, not if the rest of society is paying your health care. But how about you make an agreement to drop your health care, an agreement that you don't get to go to the emergency room when you fall over from a heart attack and cost each of us a half a million dollars by sitting in the hospital for three weeks. And I'll let you go. And you should see the blank stares on his face, right? And that's really what we're talking about is social responsibility and all this sort of too. So in your arguments, you might want to think about that. So you can expand it beyond just you know, physical anthropology. You can expand it into the social concerns of your own life. All right. Now, does that make a little better sense about what you're up against? Has a lot, a lot of silence to think about this, right? A lot of silence. So that's why I'm going to release the question, you know, quite a bit earlier, so you guys can think about it a little bit. Now, my job right now is to sort of focus on what I think is the really important parts, and I think that Homo erectus, the very first human, is extremely important because it really tells us what we're evolved to do so much. So I want to have a look at that. So I'm going to stop that share, and we'll start going into erectus a little bit. At the same time, we're, we're thinking about these big ideas of changing the world and stuff. We have to you know, bear down the practical stuff, the fossil record, and when these things existed too, because it's very important to get factual about that. Because if you're going to argue with somebody about something, you have to have facts. You got to know something, you know. And and, and people are, are pretty shrewd. I mean, they can tell if you're bullshitting or you know what you're talking about. And college is about learning to know what you're talking about. So we talked about the very first true humans. I mean, true humans, okay? 
you know, there these when we hit this level, we're talking about this cluster of species here, Homo ergaster erectus. This is when all the traits of humans are really there. Okay. This is when we leave the Australopith world around and we're squarely within ours. Now, we leave the Australopith world about 2.5 million years ago, and we arrive here solidly about 1.8. So that's roughly 700,000 years of transition. Yes, there are various interstitial tectonics, you know, our transitional species in between those times that are coming in our direction. And everyone has been arguing and trying to find out which one of those transitionals can we call the first member of the genus Homo? And whoever wins that argument has found that fossil ends up on Time Magazine. <laughs> and that's a lot of the political issues that are involved in this, right? I stay out of that and I just say, when do we have the first actual human, not the transitional stuff right here, okay? Now, these two things you see here, Homo ergaster, Homo is our genus, ergo is a species as well as Homo erectus, Homo is our genus, erectus species, species are essentially the same thing. They're essentially the same thing. Now, there are important minute differences, and that only talks a little bit about migrations. Okay? So every one of us in this room and everywhere around the world is descended from Homo ergaster, because that's the species that stayed, began in Africa and stayed in Africa. Okay? Then that will, will go on and develop into more archaic forms of humans and eventually to modern humans. Now, Homo ergaster that happens to leave Africa like 1.8 million years ago when it's devolving, moves up into Asia and stays there and develops some subtly small differences. And we call that Homo erectus. Okay? But those terms were created like 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Um, when we didn't have a lot of fossil evidence for what we call back migration. You know, when you know, things move away in the world, they're not moving out. They're like, I don't like the climate here. I'm going to go to Asia where it's nice and sunny or where it rains more. That's not the way, that's not the way these early creatures were thinking. Early homos were, were, were looking for game. They're following, you know, the best road to good foods. And as the climate changes, they're making you know, random walks around and they're going to end up back in Africa again. And when they do, they're going to rehybridize, you know, with what was back in Africa. And we do see evidence of this. Thus, we're talking about not two different species. You know, if you can hybridize, you're the same species. And at most, you're subspecies. So really, what we've got here is Homo ergaster and Homo ergaster erectus. Because to create a subspecies, you just add the third at the end. So they're really subspecies of each other. Now, this argument has been going on for a long time because there's a lot of old crotchety physical anthropology professors out there who 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 believe they've taught this 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 whole thing that there's two different species for so long they're not willing to back down they're arguing because they're going to argue to their die right that's just the way the politics are with this stuff but then you cats like me you're like we don't care about your bullshit we want you to die retire and go away and then we can change the textbooks over okay and that's what we're going to be doing but how is it we sort of compromised Compromise, we just call everything Homo erectus. Right? That's what we've done. So in this class, I'm just going to refer to everything as Homo erectus, but know that that argument is there. And it's also one that's going to be settled by younger generations, really putting the full, you know, full resolution as you guys continue to find more fossil species. Okay. So a chart with Homo erectus on it. <clears throat> this really shows distribution, you know, and what's happening through time that our genus really begins to come around at 2 million and that's sort of lumping it really solidly at 1.8. Um, erectus is in Africa and just about 1.7 to 1.6 begins to spread out through the Middle East and finally Eurasia. And it will actually make it all the way into Europe, which we're going to see. You can see Erectus moves all the way into Europe. So it was the first you know, of the hominins to leave Africa. So I used to have a question on, on my exams, which were the first primate, which were the group, first groups of primates to leave Africa? Well, those were the Miocene apes, right? They just moved from Africa. We can see that from Victoria Pathicus that left Africa and it went up into uh, Europe, uh, sorry, Europe, right? And then diversified all sorts of ape groups. But that's an ape. One of the first hominids that actually left Africa really is Homo erectus. Following big game because it's changed its mode of subsistence, the way in which it's getting food in an important way, which we'll see soon, but we'll see what this thing looks like and what it's built for. And we'll make some inferences on what it's actually doing for a living. 
right? So through time, as it begins to be modernized, you know, the, the rectus spreads and it affects all the way down to Java, you know, in China, all the way up into, even we see a finding in Boxgrove, England. And there are other little starts that happen like in the Middle East and the European steppes that are going in different directions, you know, splitter groups. We can expect to see, you know, cladogenesis. Something called a homo antecessor starts to sort of go off a little bit. It doesn't make, it uh, doesn't make it. That's the thing, all the experiments and tries. You know? Even Erectus itself, you know, is extinct by, we think, you know, 400,000 years ago. And one of the reasons it's extinct is because Erectus, you know, although homo ergaster, I like to call it, as it stays in Africa, begins to modernize. Okay? And modernize is increasing brain size. The rectus in the rest of the world, the brain size stays pretty much the same. Maybe a little tiny growth. But rectus in Africa begins to, the brain begins to swell and swell and swell and become modern. And then the groups of humans begin to move out across the world. And where rectus is there, the rectus is replaced, is put to extinction. Remember, one creature per niche. See, we're in the same genus. That means we have the same niche. And that's why we're the last human standing, because all members of our genus have the same niche, and the same and the niche is everything. What is it that we can't get? What is what is what creature can't we throw out of this ditch? If we wanted all the game from lions and tigers, we could take it instantly. Because we want to appear benevolent and be smart about this, we don't kill all the lions. If we could we kill all the whales? Yes, we could. Could we kill everything? Yes, we could, but we realize we're smart enough to realize it would collapse the ecosystems in ourselves, right? Well, you know, other modes of, of the genus Homo are pretty smart too. That's the same niche. So as we spread out, other humans are there. Ours is slightly improved, better at defending the niche. Therefore, they go extinct. We're the last human standing. Okay. So this is our story. Is really to follow that line of Erectus in Africa all the way to ourselves, with a little look at what's going on the outside too, because it's very interesting. So let's look, you know, a little bit about what maybe, <clears throat> you know, um, uh, early Homo erectus looked like. Now, you know, postcranial, that's up from the shoulders down. That thing's just like us. You could not tell, really. Looking at it in a human population, there would be no difference. That is a big, strong human. You know, that thing's six feet tall. I'm sorry, six feet tall. They have our height. They have lost that short problem that Australopithecines have. That 600 to 700 year of transition was a huge one. It threw on 40% greater body size as well as brain size. Australopiths, you know, in somewhere around 430, 440 cubic centimeters of brain, you know, maybe 450. This thing's in the 800 level. That's, you know, 45% greater brain, 40 to 45% greater brain capacity. That's huge. We see the, the largest major jump, you know, in primates. So we're moving from Australopiths to the genus Homo in that 700,000 year. Now, one of the reasons that we think that's doing that is we hit some sort of critical mass where the brain just got large enough to where it began to think in all sorts of new ways, enough neural connections were there to allow it to produce more, enough sophisticated tools that it began to hunt and to hunt super efficiently to where it was getting enough calories and surplus calories in that it could fuel evolutionary brain growth. It would be consistent without curtailing the loss of individuals because the brain eats up so much calories. Remember, this thing eats up 25% of all the calories and oxygen which you take in, right? Additionally, it takes just about that much of the vital uh, vitamins of your body, real critical vitamins. This stuff's expensive tissue. And if you're not getting in food consistently, it's not gonna grow. And you know, in early primates, you know, hominids were starvation adaptive machines. So we're talking about, you know, marginal amounts of calories is why we don't see, you know, brain growth in Australopithecus. It's pretty much flatlined, but something changes here. Something changes here with that 700,000 year period. All right, so we have 800 cubic centimeters. Well, compared to what? Let's compare ourselves to ourselves. We're around 1450 to 1500 cubic centimeters. So literally just about 45% larger than this, right? Well, here's the thing is that in 700,000 years, uh, brain size went up 45%, right? Well, you know, it's going to take another million and a half years for brain size to increase that 45% again. So the big leap was establishing our genus. Then we're going to have a nice, steady, you know, almost linear sort of crawl until this sort of brain size 
because that's what happens. We're not jumping uh, between genuses. When we went, we left the Australopithecus to the human. That was a huge jump. When you move between genuses, it's a huge jump. So the next changes aren't going to be huge because we're staying in the same genus. It's a linear sort of climb. And that linear climb is really from the shoulders up. Now, what is it about this thing that we can see as human? Okay, postcranially down here, human. But if you look at, you know, Homo erectus in the eyes, you know, there's something human there. It's not ape-like anymore. It's something that we can identify with. And you know what? That is a, that's an important thing. When you're talking about looking at something that you can identify with, it's more important than you can actually ever imagine, ever imagine. There is a film, uh, all I'm sure wise watch, it's a very short presentation, only 15 minutes, and it's called Mirror Neuro. So about 10 years ago, uh, 12 years ago at this point, um, a, science, a scientist in, in Italy, in La, in La Parma, in Italy, were um, looking and uh, doing some primate research. And they noticed that, um, that you know, monkeys and particularly apes, um, that, you know, when, you, when they're picking stuff up and they're wired to all these new brain leads, that they, you know, you can see the motor neurons firing as they're picking up all these things, right? But what they didn't realize is that is at one time the monkey wasn't doing anything, right? And putting his arms down like this, and the humans were picking up all of these objects. And all of a sudden the monkey's neurons began to fire as if it were actually doing something by watching something doing it, right? No other species, no other sort of group of mammals does this. And then you start trying to look at human beings. And it was overwhelming. It wasn't just a little response watching other people. It was like doing it yourself. So the motor neurons in you fire. In the same way as you actually picking something up is when you're watching somebody doing something. That's a different level. Of, we call these things mirror neurons. And really what that does is it allows you to emplace yourself and another person through the eyes. You're looking at something. Something connects you deeply on a cellular level. There's nothing like, you know, moving in and out of the same side of the body, literally. But you're actually mentally moving out of the side of your body. You're sharing that person's disposition. And that's empathy. Have you noticed that, you know, you, that when you go to movies, a movie, a one-dimensional screen in front of you trying to, to, to give a three-dimensional object, you know you're in a movie theater, but you'll cry. Something will happen and it'll, it'll make you cry like a baby, you know? What the hell happened? How could that happen? This is the mirror neurons fire, right? Your feeling empathy ties you closer to other things. Not only that, when you're watching somebody doing something, it's like you doing it. That's a form of learning. Right, instantly learning something, instantly learning something. So we get learning behavior really quickly for mirror neurons, and we also get social empathy. But that's what humans are about. What else is the word human, humanity about? A group or a, a group of humans that care about each other, that empathize about each other for the common purpose of survival for the group. So when the mirror neurons begin to really increase, we're really seeing those big increases in Homo erectus. Um, and that means these groups are watching and protecting each other. Thus, they're able to move out of the trees, not have to sleep in the trees anymore, and also be able to do something different for a living. And that's big game hunt, right? They're large, strong creatures, lots of mirror neurons, a lot of empathy for each other. You know, for example, I mean, I, I, it, it's, it's typical. If you watch chimpanzees, while they're very much you know, like us in many ways, if you watch two chimpanzees, when it's done, you know, there's a family called the Boucher family um, that works in Africa, particularly in the subspecies Vera of chimps. And regularly, you know, they'll see things, you know, because they're there 24 hours a day. But like chimpanzees will be up in a treetop and like one of the chimps will climb to the bottom, right? And like the chimps are really close. They've been with each other since they're born. And then one of the chimps will climb out of the tree onto the ground and then bam, a jaguar will be there, bam, or a leopard. And the, the chimp's gone, right? The whole chimps group just start screaming and they're terrified and their hearts are ripped, literally ripped out of their chest. There's, there's even tears going on, but not one of those chimps will jump out of that branch to help his friend down there. You know, if your best friend Joe's in the ground, Mike's not jumping out of that tree. Mike chimps not jumping in that tree to help. How about humans, right? You don't believe me, look at that issue. Look back at 20 years ago to 9-11, you know, with, with the whole Twin Towers thing. And watch the firemen running inside of that building, hearing the floors pounding down. They're still going in there to rescue people. They're not doing it for the $80,000 a year. I quit my damn job because I'm smarter than that. Because I understand how mirror neurons work. They're going in there because they see those people as themselves, right? 
And that's what it takes, something like this. Even though it's a big, strong human, compare that to a lion or a hyena group, right? No chance. That can't make it in those conditions unless it protects itself as a species. And again, they're doing it because of a different mode of existence. They're now persistence hunting. You see, now that we're tall, yeah, we're also more efficient. Our strides are efficient when we walk, extremely efficient. In fact, that thing right there is five times more efficient when it travels on the ground than a chimpanzee, five times, and four times more efficient than any mammal that ever lived. You see, all that, moving through the Australopithecus, trying to get efficiency because there was no food, right? Has given this guy a new niche, a new niche. Because he can travel efficiently, okay? And he can travel for a long time efficiently because he's not using much calories when he moves. And if you don't use much calorie, you don't generate much heat. If you're efficient, there's not much heat. Now, he's tall. The amount of solar incident, the amount of sun on him is less than an animal leaning over this way. And there's also more wind on him, right? So he's cooling himself down. And additionally, through the Australopithing line, we're developing more and more and more sweat glands. So the Australopiths could only be out there during the middle of the daytime. They couldn't. They, they were there in the evenings. They had to be there in the evenings or in the mornings. They would have been killed by predators because predators are active during those times because they have a lot of hair and no sweat glands. And they have to pant. Well, this guy has all that pre-preparation from an Australopith to be out there in the middle of the day when it's blazing hot. And all he has to do is run, jog, to keep running after a wildebeest or an antelope until it tires out, until it overheats and literally lays down with heat prostration. It rocks up to it with a rock and hits it on the head and drags it home. That's persistence hunting. This thing did that for over a million years. The same thing. That's all we see it doing. But in that million years, it paved its way to produce this body with the same sorts of requirements, you know, not only food group wise, but exercise wise that that thing had. And you don't improve it yourself. You know, we think people that run 100 miles, even 200 miles are extraordinary. No, they're not. They're just average because they're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Humans are the best endurance race uh, uh, runners we've ever seen. And we beat horses all the time. We have races against horses that are long distance beat horses. There's nothing that can move like humans do, right? Because we're super efficient. Well, we'll have to see what this portends to ourselves body-wise and how it really helps Homo erectus. And how does Homo erectus develop this point into anatomically modern humans, right? All right. So, you know, a little point here, I don't want to go into it too much, um, is that you know, there is a small difference I mentioned, you know, between you know, the erectus, the, 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 the ergaster that starts in Africa and some populations of this stuff sort of leave Africa to Asia. What are the subtle differences? Well, okay, it's cooler in Asia. They're up higher in North, right? So, you know, to protect the brain, to keep it as warm as possible, because the thing about it is hypothermia. When you get cold, the thing that really hurts is your reasoning, right? You get fuzzy headed and lightheaded because your brain gets too cold. So what do you do? You evolve to have slightly thicker cranial bones. So we see an erectus in the North, slightly thicker, okay? Um, and a little bit better eye shell. And one of the things that eye shells do, a little bit the brow ridges up here, is a is a knockdown of the glare, but they also increase the warmth under the eyes. And guys, if you know this stuff, but when it's really hot outside, the worst thing I do is take off my sunglasses. That really vents a huge amount of heat, right? Huge amount of heat. But in the same thing too, when it's really cold outside, I put my sunglasses on, right? Because I want to keep this part of my face warm because a huge amount of heat is lost actually through your eyes. So that shelf down there is like a little bun warmer. It keeps the eyes a little bit warm too. But they're not, we, we don't really see many differences and that's really why we can see these things just as subspecies, all right. Okay, so what about our distribution? Where do we find these erectus set? Well, okay, so this is the chart was produced in 2013, which is getting kind of old, you know, even by fossil standards because so many young people are coming into our discipline I don't know, what is this about young people and Range Rovers? You guys just love to drive Range Rovers all over Africa and Asia and do all that sort of stuff. And you guys are like the new kind of camping generation. You get out, you're really good at, you're good at getting advanced and living everywhere. And that's what it takes to be a sort of an anthropologist. You like to drive your van around and now they have those uh, sprinter vans. They just build them out and you take your grant money, build them out and you travel over the world 
And you also want, most of you guys party. I know you guys. I know all my physical anthropology students. I got all the PhDs that came from, from, from my little junior college programs. And they're kind of giving me all these pictures of their lives out there. All I do is drink, drink and fossil hunting all the time. So we've actually increased, you know, our breadth of fossils, but not the geographical distribution. We're just filling in more and more where you see these red dots at, okay? So we know this is the distribution of Homo erectus all the way up into Britain. You can see in Boxer of England, Spain, German, we found the Maurer Mount Mandible up there. Kosabas, we've in Turkey, uh, Dominici uh, in the Republic of Georgia. Uh, we see them in, in China, all the way to Eastern China, um, down in Indonesia. So the thing about it is people go, oh, they must've built boats. No, they didn't. Uh, there's been so many glacial cycles going on that the glacial cycles used to be pretty intense. I mean, world glaciation, it was world glaciation, and that meant sea level could drop over 300 feet, 300 feet, because everything was locked up in ice. And most of the seas moving out towards Indonesia are very shallow, They're about 280 feet. So when it goes down to below 280, that is exposed, sort of marshlands. And Homo erectus actually walked out into these areas. Okay? Now they never made it to Australia because the deep water channels there, those are hundreds and thousands of feet deep. So Homo erectus wasn't able to move there because they were not clever enough to build boats with their 800 cc's of brains. But they were clever enough to build really some of the very first sophisticated tools though. And we'll be looking at what those sophisticated tools are the last thing we do today, then I'll, think, I'll pick up on this next week. Okay. So tools, all right. You know, one thing about it is we look at the fossil record, that's all we've got are stone tools left. It doesn't mean there's not using other tools. There could be bone out there, you know, wood tools, bamboo, all sorts of stuff they're producing, but it's not gonna survive time. You know, even in the fossil record, what do you see about the skeleton? You find bones and teeth. You're not gonna find skin millions of years old. Well, the same thing with tools. Thus, we sort of have to grain our inferences about their abilities from the stone tools they leave behind. And so we just, we, we, stone is also metallithic. So when you see the word lithic, it also means stone, okay? So paleolithic, so paleo old, old, lithic, old stone tools, okay? So there are three divisions of these old stone tools, all right? So what we're gonna be looking at right first are what we call the lower paleolithic, low, old, old stuff. You know, that's Ergaster erectus that we're talking about there. Now then next week, we're gonna start making this sort of movement into the archaic members of our species beginning, you know, 800,000 years ago to 600,000 years ago. And they're gonna make a different sort of tool. New sort of brain size can produce a new sort of vision and tool making. And that's gonna continue, you know, uh, um, up until literally 15,000 years ago, but uh, we do move out of the Paleolithic in about 50 to 70,000 years ago into sort of a Neolithic, a new tool making. And that's when modern humans come along. And we're gonna look at that the very last week. We're gonna, we're gonna save all that stuff to the last week. See what sort of explosion the modern mind made, right? And what is so different about this? What, so I wanna be able to, you guys to think about this. Okay? What would be the conversation right now if you and Homo erectus was in the same room, I mean, what would be the common ground and how would you guys react with each other? That's kind of what I want you to make some inferences about by the time we finish this discussion and get down to modern humans. Okay? It's always what we talk about at, at uh, anthropology conferences anyway, it's really fun. Okay? okay, so in these tool traditions, these lower, middle and upper, we also have some smaller divisions, which are really important because sometimes people, you know, they lump stuff too much together. And when we say lower paleolithic, there's too much lumped together there. It's, it's not diagnostic enough. So we have to break the lower into at least two smaller divisions, okay? Oldowan and Acheulean. Pretty simple. Oldowan is the kind of stuff the late Australopithecus are making. Acheulean is the stuff that Homo erectus is making. Notice there's a little overlap. Because it takes, you know, the, uh, the, the, Ashul the Oldowan tools are still pretty good. They're good. They're, they're quick and dirty tools. You know, and the Acheulean tools are, you know, are are still are are still good, and they overlap together for a while until the Acheulean becomes so good they can leave the old one behind. That's what we're doing right now. Because when I got my new car, I turned on the radio. It wasn't like Sirius or Exus. It was a regular radio. I got radio stations, but right next to it I had my little MP3 player, right, and I had my internet connection. So I'm now living in both worlds. I got the analog world going and I got the digital world going and both seem to work just fine. 
Well, that's what we're going to think about the early awesome, these early Homo erectus. You know, they're still utilizing some of the tools of the old world, and they're re they're starting to employ their new tools. And eventually, the old world will go away, just like my old FM trend, you know, transmitter in my car is going to be gone. So it's all going to be digital. All the radio transmitters where I get my regular TV are going to be gone. It's all going to be digital cable, and I'm going to be paying a ton of money, mm, right? So let's think about old Wan tools. You know, what are they like? Well, here's a little chart. Okay, so at the very top. Um, we're looking at what we call um, Homo erectus sort of tools at the very beginning stages, okay? So from left to right, so you go to the very top, it says Acheulean, right? From left to right. So the very first Acheulean tools are like over on the left and they end up sort of over you know, on the right-hand side. But what was before that? Okay, basically you take a round like river rock and you hit it hard on something and it breaks. And if you get a sharp, anything sharp on one side, you have an old wand tool. That's it. And it's good at kind of cracking stuff, maybe breaking some bones, maybe to get some bone marrow out. Right? Now, what's different about this when they begin to do it, they realize that they can hit it several times and start making unique sort of shapes at the ends. You know, the ends okay? Then they refine and they realize they can get even more flaking out of it, make a uniform sort of blade surface like in the middle there. Okay? And then just about 1.6 million years ago, what Homo erectus finds is something changes in his brain something literally changes in his brain because we see the tools you know not only work from one side but work from both sides they're getting a sharp edge from both sides right and the tools become symmetrical they're absolutely symmetrical they're no longer just sort of you know rough tools with one side in fact they ocd out we find these huge middens you know of junk like you know wasted tools where they start working on they throw them away because they're not symmetrical and that is human. If you don't believe me, watch this. So as an instructor, I love, you know, I love watching human beings. And I watch you guys come to my class all the time. And you guys get OCD all the time. So I'll let you come in. You take your little books or your little laptops, your phone, and you put them on the table. And all of a sudden, you'll sit there while and you'll start moving it around to where it lines up completely square with the desk you're sitting in. And you'll look there, and you'll line it up, and you'll line it up. And something's driving you to do this. It's driving you nuts. You see, that quest for symmetry is something that's changing in the neural architecture, and it's right here. It starts about 1.6 million years ago. We can see that shift into producing what we call the Acheulean hand axe. And it's that tool which begins to evolve this symmetrical, bifacially worked on both sides, sharp, symmetrical tool that's around for a million years. Literally, that's, the, that's where they end up at. That's where they stop. That's where they stop. The, the most they can do is make this Acheulean hand axe. Right? Now, in many ways, this shows limitations. It also shows the superiority of these because nothing in the world is able to make an Acheulean hand axe that's symmetrical before this. And if I tried, to, if I gave you guys a block of chert and said, come back to me in three months and figure it out, you wouldn't be able to do it. How do I know? So, one of the things about going to graduate school is not like undergraduate. There's lots more money, and I wish I, I wish I had tons of money to give you guys and do all this sort of stuff. Go to grad school, there's money. So I walked into my biological anthropology lab for the first time, graduate level, right? This guy by the name of Jeff Schwartz, Professor Jeff Schwartz, he's still at University of Pittsburgh. So the first thing is like, hello, everybody, here's your chart. So he gives you a block of chart, okay? And he shows you an Acheulean hand axe, a real one. He's got one fossilized, you know, a real stone. This thing like a million and a half years old. He goes, you guys, you need to make that, okay? So I want you guys to come back next week. You can use any tools you want. You can use modern hammers. You can use chisels. You can do anything that you want to do. Other rocks, but just bring me the Acheulean hand axe. That's all you got to do. So we <laughs> come back next week and nobody, everyone has broken rocks. He goes, ah, oh, you all failed. I'm so disappointed. He started to laugh. And he goes, he goes, because actually, if any one of you were successful about this, Right? I would accuse you of cheating, right, or, or taking it because you can't do it, you know. And, and I said, well, why? What? The, what? Why can't we do this? He goes, you don't realize what's involved in this. This is like fifteen hundred sequential strokes that you have to hit just in the right way. And in fact, sometimes when the blade gets sharp on one side, you actually have to dull it, dull one end of it. So when you hit it again, it builds up enough uh, tension that the pressure waves move through the rock in just the right way to flake it in the right way. And Homo erectus knew about. This. 
Not only that, when we see these big waste piles of rocks out there where they've started blades, it's not just because they're not symmetrical, it's because they can hear, they can tap it and hear fractures, imperfections, and they know to stop because the thing's gonna fail. So they are able to actually read the source material too. So when we talk about what were the intellectual properties of these things, they're not doing Shakespeare, but they can build a mean tool, right? So we had to think about, you know, really what sort of intelligence do we have against them? I mean, there's the practical aspects of life, of building stuff utilitarian. There's the other stuff that we do that they probably can't do. For instance, in this period, which I'm talking to you, I guarantee you, you guys' minds have drifted all sorts of places, many to Hawaii, many to all sorts of places, and many places I don't want to know about and don't share. Okay? You can't stop but daydreaming living in hyper reality right and that's what we do that's what we build our entertainment systems for to take us out of reality if the one thing humans don't like it is reality we're always trying to build ourselves in imaginative worlds that's probably not homo erectus he's not sitting in those mythological religious frameworks and cartoons and everything which we do he could only live in the real but in the real he's pretty darn good at it right okay not an imaginative quality but in the real and in fact because we see that a Shulian hand axe is the only thing the stop part they make for the million years, we realize they're not very inventive. In fact, it's probably the smartest Homo erectus to ever live. Ever live, like the Einstein that made the, the tool and then he showed somebody. And that has been an unbroken chain of teaching you know, for a million years. And they couldn't go beyond it because they don't have the ability to imagine, the ability to imagine, which in many ways is common with humans too. So you realize, if you guys realize this, that if any one of you were placed on like a desert island with another human when you're babies and you had no knowledge about the world ever, it would take you guys 100,000 years of relearning everything which we do now to create this world, which is why education is so important to relay it across or everything that you have around you disappears. <laughs> do not take this stuff for granted. It's education for granted. Well, that's what happened with, with Homo erectus. So we know they can learn. We know culture, the transmission of culture really begins right there within this species, okay? Now, the implications of that hand axe, how does it transform the body, right? Is very important because the tools we begin to build do transform our bodies, transform our abilities. If for instance, when you see lions hunt, you know, they have these big, huge you know, canines out there, not humans, that becomes our canine. And in a ferocious way, right? <laughs> you know, big, we, we have a, a, a Shulian hand axe to a foot long. We become tremendous ferocious canines, you know, out there on these open African savannas we spread across the world. And we'll see what how that remodels the body, where that takes us the next time we meet next week. Okay, so I'm gonna stop it right there. I've gone for an hour. Um, of course, you, as you can see, I'm very excited about this subject. I love Homo erectus. I think it's just a, a fascinating point of our evolutionary history. So any questions or comments on what we looked at last hour? Does it make any sense? I mean, there, that was good. There, there's a lot of information. Um, I mean, I had a question earlier, but you kind of answered it like when you, when you, when you went on. So um, I, I don't have anything. Okay, good. So at this point, you know, any questions you have when you're reading a book or you're getting ready to write your essays or what you just call me, let me know. I'm, I'm here to support for you guys, okay? because I want you to write the best day possible. I, I, I do, and I want you to have something as a writing sample, because what you don't realize when you leave college, people are gonna be asking you, give me a writing sample. So if you can give them something really good, man, there you go, you might get the job. So it may not be from this class, but at least in some classes have three pieces of writing samples that are great, okay? okay so that's my- wait, wait, I do actually have one question. Go for it. I forgot. So for the final, right, the essay final, yeah. Um, do you want us to put like a, an introduction in the conclusion paragraph or? Well, the thing about it is, is you got to let people know. Now, I'm not going to hold you guys to some sort of five, you know, five, you know, compartment you know, essay, the kind of crap they do in English, because I think that's old hat and it doesn't translate well in the modern world. So what you have to do is tell is slippery open like you. I want you to write this like you're talking to somebody. How would you mm -hmm. introduce a subject? Um, a guy used to be on 60 Minutes, his name is Andy Rooney, he had the famous slippery opening. He'd always say, have you ever thought about this? Everybody's dropping dead of cancer or this. I think I know why. You know, I think it's because of this. And you start a conversation that way, right? 
So what's your slippery opening going to be like? You know, what's your roadmap of where you're directing the conversation to? And that first paragraph needs to be telling people what you're going to be trying to do and why. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, it does. And, you know, one thing about, I'm not requiring formal language, but I want you to think about this, that if someone's reading this and you say the word homo erectus, they're not going to know what the hell you're talking about. So mm-hmm. defining stuff for people is very important. And that's where learning, I can see if you're learning, if you know how to define words for people, right, and explain mm-hmm. stuff, that shows me you know what you're talking about. And when someone's reading your essay, they'll be learning too. Okay, got All it. Right. Okay. All right. Sounds good. All right. I'll talk to you guys next week then or soon if you want to go. All right. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Nice to see you too. Nice to see you. Nice for stopping in.